Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us today. Uh, we're, if you have heard us before, you're aware that we are doing the Sabbath School lessons uh, prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons for the first quarter of 2013 is entitled Origins. And this lesson is lesson number 10. It's on stewardship and the environment. We'd like you to get your Bibles and join us, but First of all, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we look for your guidance in all things. We know that there are many issues affecting our environment at this point in time as we see massive changes taking place and we wonder to what extent uh, human growth and uh, developments and expansions are impacting our earth. Help us to know the role you want us to play, and especially in light of the fact that you might be coming again soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm delighted to have a special guest with us today. <coughs> Dr. Jim Gibson is head of the Geoscience Research Institute located here on the campus of Lumberland University. And he's particularly important to our discussion today because he had the wonderful privilege, I see him smiling, uh, of writing this series of lessons Jim, would you tell us how long ago you wrote these lessons? Well, it takes about three, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it was in the fall of 2009 when I got to writing in earnest mm -hmm. and finished them up during uh, 2010, the first part. And, then and you volunteered for this job? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I was stupefied <laughs> to be asked to write the lessons. Totally unexpected. But no, I didn't volunteer, but... It seemed like an interesting opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Now, I've, we've noticed as we've been through most of the quarter now that there's lots of great work in the scriptures and so forth, but you're not a theologian per se. You're a, a scientist, a biologist. Uh, would you like to do the series once again and from a biological point of view? Well, there's lots of interest in the biology and, and that's issues, but this, you know, Sabbath school lessons are Bible studies. Yeah. And so it was my intention, a conscious choice, to make this a Bible study. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things that can be said, but uh, not, in, not necessarily everything needs to be said in a Sabbath school class. Okay. Uh, did you have some theological help? Because there's some great <coughs> stuff here in theology here. Or you have some kind of degrees in that area? Oh, no, I don't have any degrees. But I have had some privilege uh, of attending an annual series of meetings in which theologians would present papers on the subject of origins. Mm -hmm. And so some of the leading theologians over the past 25 years have presented papers that I've been able to listen to. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them have Hebrew textual analysis, some of them are theological, comparative studies. And so I've benefited a great deal from these these who are truly expert in the area. Great. Very good. Well, feel free to join us in our discussion. We're delighted to have you with us. We, we know that uh, these lessons go to the world field and uh, understand that there are multiple committees that, uh, that look at these. Uh, do you recognize what we're going to study tonight? <laughs> yes. Yes. In fact, uh, they, they modified it. There are wording changes, there are occasional significant changes, but all for the best. And uh, yeah, uh, I was given the, the assignment to write a quarterly on creation. I chose to make that the scope of that Genesis 1 to 3. I could have done it differently, but I chose Genesis mm -hmm. 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the lessons, uh, I chose the topics. Yeah. And if you look at the series of lessons, you'll see the first four lessons deal with the biblical background and the basis for creation. The next set of four lessons deals with human morality, the problem of evil, and, th and the effects of the fall. There's sort of a unit there. Then the third set of four lessons deals with applications of creation. How does creation guide us in our own personal lives? Sabbath, uh, stewardship, marriage, and the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then the final lesson is sort of a, 
well, the new creation, kind of tying it back to the original creation. So that's the structure of the lessons. There really is structure there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Okay, so you, you didn't disown the lessons after you saw, they, saw them come out. No, I was pleased they rescued me from my errors. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, as we look at our rapidly expanding world with forests being torn down to make room for more human habitation, um, and other creatures being decimated. I'm, I'm sure, Jim, that you could tell us more than most of us know about how many species are being lost every day or whatever. Um, ice caps are melting up north and so forth. What kind of long-term implications do you think that has for man and uh, this earth? Anybody participate? But uh, do you see a problem with that? Well, uh, I mean, you would. One possibility is I've heard someone who supposedly knew what they were talking about saying that if, if all the ice caps melted, or even I think it was just Antarctica, all of it melted, the, the ocean would rise 200 feet. Well, that would be a little hard on Los Angeles and New York City. And yeah, but you're talking about um, population explosion, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Is that you're going to try to get rid of some of the population that way? No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering because God gave the command to be fruitful and multiply. He never anywhere in the Bible said to stop, stop, there's enough. No. So He didn't plan for us to be around this long either. Well, okay, but I think in his <laughs> foreknowledge, he kind of knows where the, um, okay. how much resources he needs. Actually, he did plan for us to be around this long, just not in this state. Yeah, exactly. Not in a fallen that's state. That's more correct. Yeah. <laughs> Given the, the concept that sin is destructive, and the earth seems to be, I mean, the humanity seems to be getting more and more evil, does that have an effect on, on, on the earth? In other words, do you think the sin will destroy us? Will it also destroy the earth? And if so, when? Well, let me start out with an obvious point. If you look at the diet designed for Eden, back in Eden, there was no plan, there was no plan for even a plant to die. We ate the fruit. We were supposed to eat the fruits and the products of the plants. There was no reason for the plant to die. Animals were to eat leaves and so forth off the plants. There was no reason for the plant to die. So back in the beginning, it's pretty clear that God never intended for even a plant to die. Well, look where we are now. So uh, it's pretty obvious how that. Do you, how do you get that from that information? Well, well I mean, I've always wondered about that because. Say that, um, like what Ellen White did once she, in her vision, she picked a flower and she said, oh, it's beautiful, and it'll never fade. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going to happen to that flower when you start picking these flowers? Or what, what's going to happen to them? Well, maybe we won't pick them. We well, she them. did. Yeah. You eat them. Okay. You eat them? You eat them. That's a possibility. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess my point is that um, if you have a flower garden out there, you're not going to be able to rearrange it? Sure. Take that plant and put it somewhere else and put it another plant in its place. We put, rearrange. Another plant in its, put another plant in its place? Sure. Okay, then after a couple billion years, you've got a big old pile of, of um, plants out there. You know there. what? I'm going to leave that to no, the good Lord to No, it. this is a good question. Okay. No, because, it's not. because <laughs> Yes, it is. It is a very good question. <laughs> it is a very good question because we got to be making sense of what we're saying. Yeah. Don't you think? I, I, I agree. Uh, however, I, we don't know, we don't have enough information about how that's going to be dealt with to, I mean, we, we, we talk about Adam and Eve, even back in the garden. Now, that's something in past history you might know something about. We don't know whether what they produced any waste at all. Maybe God will design, redesign the plants so that they're perfectly absorbed when we eat them and so forth, and there won't be any waste. Uh, I don't know. And, uh, we, so. we didn't have any warning here or instruction how to deal with the plants, but he did give instruction to take dominion over the other creatures. Yeah. And, and well, and, the verses that were relevant to what I said are Genesis 1, 29 and 30. Uh, I have provided all kinds of grain and all kinds of fruit for you to eat. You, you don't have to destroy a plant to get that. But for all the wild animals, for all the birds, I provided grass and leafy plants for food, and it was done. So you don't have to destroy any plant to provide that kind of a diet. And you know, when you move plants around, you don't destroy them. No. You dig them up and you redesign your garden and you just plant mm -hmm. them again. Aren't you guys forgetting about putting them in your mouth and chewing? 
Yeah, but you don't have to but kill the you're plant. You're not killing the that. plant to do that. You don't have to. And that's just a, that's just the product of the plant. The plant's still growing out of the ground. You pluck a when you pluck parsley off. The parsley plant is still there. An apple, the apple tree is still there. Well, yeah, but also the apple trees are making more apple trees, and the parsley is making more parsley, and the maybe, mint maybe really gets out of control. Maybe <laughs> not in heaven. Maybe uh, it's in control, or maybe it goes smaller, or maybe it goes larger, well, depending on what you want. This doesn't happen in heaven. This happens on the earth. Well, he was talking about in heaven, wasn't he? No, no he was, I was talking, talking about the new, probably the... I was talking about the original state. And the new earth to be remade. You well, know, there's, there's a lot of speculation. Um, I even heard one pastor speculate, and he said it was speculation, and, you know, in trying to solve this problem of, you know, we're supposed to go and reproduce, but eventually, we, and he was suggesting that, <clears throat> you know, there's lots of planets out here, <clears throat> perhaps, perhaps those planets and starry heavens were, were created for us so that, you know, we would go and have our own planets, you know, it's a, it's a lot of speculation. We can speculate a long time, and there's church, different churches have taken major, major uh, stands on that issue, and I don't think we really need to go there. We've got a lot of other things to talk about. Um, if you look in Genesis 1, uh, in the command when God created humans, there's three aspects of man's relationship to the environment that come out of that. The first one is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. And the second one is subdue it. Mm -hmm. And the third one is have dominion over the creatures. And he names the creatures. So those are, those are three things that, it, that guide our relationship to the environment. And one of the crucial points, I think, is this idea of subdue mm -hmm. and dominion. Subdue is the same word in Hebrew that's used for what a king does to his kingdom. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a royal term, a, a term of sovereignty, to subdue. Mm -hmm. And dominion is also obviously a kingly kind of uh, role. Now, what would be the biblical view of the duties and responsibilities of a king? Let's make it a good king. Mm -hmm. I think Adam and Eve would surely be appointed to be good yeah. kings. Sure. So this dominion and this subduing need to be interpreted in the context of the assignment of doing things well mm -hmm. the way God would do them or have them done. Yeah. So yeah. how does that guide our relationship, our development and population? Well, can you define subdue and can you define submission? Like when we're to subdue, what exactly does that mean? And to have right. dominion, what does that mean? I think it means to rule as kings over the, over the world. And subdue? means to get under control? Yes, yes, and to rule with authority. Rule with authority, get under control, and dominion is? Kingly function, just sovereignty. Just another kind of rule? It's basically, but I think, a, overlap. But in a, I think the model would be God. Mm -hmm. how, he, exactly. how he rules, how he subdues, how he supports, how he maintains, how he, how he nurtures that which he is, is responsible mm -hmm. for. Yeah. Well, Jesus himself said that God cares even for the little sparrows. He counts them. He, keeps, he says he counts the hairs on our heads. Some of us have less than we used to, but um, you know, I guess he keeps count. By contrast, look what happens when God gives Satan free reign. Look at Job 1 and 2. He, like, destroyed everything he could get his hands on. What does that tell us about what might happen to our environment as God steps back, approaching the end of this world's history, and lets Satan have more and more control? Now, there are those who would argue that, given the fact that we know that seven last plagues are coming, and there are those who would argue that six of those seven last plagues, the seventh, of course, deals with the coming itself, but six of those seven last plagues might actually be the results of overpopulation, maybe nuclear explosions, whatever, directly impacts, direct impacts of human activity on the environment may re result in these seven last plagues. And I, I don't want to go there and discuss all that, but, uh, you know, w if we're headed for something like that, what does that tell us? And then, of course, at the third coming, um, after the thousand years of the millennium, uh, we're told that the entire surface of this earth will be destroyed by cleansing flames, as the words that Ellen White uses. And, of course, that fits with what we read in Isaiah 66, 24. 
She comments about it in Great Controversy 673 and Volume 4 of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 489, if you care to look that up. So if the entire world is to be destroyed in the end, and if we are to get a new heaven and a new earth, you remember Revelation 21, why waste a lot of time and effort trying to preserve our world now? God is going to remake it like the Garden of Eden anyway, in light of all that, what should be our responsibility? Maybe our job is get people ready for the second coming. We don't have to worry about the environment. Well, uh, what do you propose to do to fix it? I mean, to keep it, to keep it pristine or whatever. You mean after the second coming? After no, the I'm coming? talking about right now. If you, you know, you just asked the question that, um, you know, at the end the Lord's going to come and He's going to melt all the elements and things like that. Yeah. So what what options do we have to make keep it pristine to that time when the Lord's going to destroy well, I, it? Well, anyway? I, I would say it's not pristine at this point in time. I wouldn't call well, it pristine. Well, I mean, that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, that's what environments, well, environmentalists it, are trying to do. They're trying to keep it. it let, me, let, let me give a, an example from the scriptures. Paul looked at the slavery problem around the Mediterranean world in his day. And he, he said, instead of trying to set the church up as some kind of an agency to eliminate slavery, which of course he would like to have eliminated, he said, let's work toward <coughs> the second coming because that's going to be the fastest way to deal with the slavery problem. So, you know, you may, not, you may or may not agree with that, but if we all, who, if every Christian were really prepared for the second coming, it would happen so fast there couldn't possibly be any environmental changes be, between now and the day when Jesus comes again. Then we wouldn't have to worry about the environment. I have a question. Yeah. When Cain and Abel wanted to worship God, Cain offered one thing. Cain offered the fruit, mm -hmm. and Abel offered the fat and uh, his first lamb. lamb. So how is that conserving what God had provided? And well, everything then was sacrifice, 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 killing yeah. animals. Yeah, uh, and of course, that was done in the setting of sin. It wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think there's any anybody who would argue that we're going to continue offering lambs in the new earth. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's true. You know, Ken, um, it's getting to be springtime, so I noticed the sparrows in my yard and in the trees, and I always look at them. And you talk about the seven last plagues and how the earth is. I figure God cares for the sparrows. I see the sparrow dipping in a little um, pond I have in the yard and splashing around, uh, grabbing something off a tree or something like that. And I figure God cares for those sparrows. So when we're experiencing hard times, I think God's going to take care of us like a little sparrow. And we're going to be out in the wilderness uh, and there's going to be water and there's going to be something to eat in the environment. So I think... Um, I don't know, even as bad as the world's going to get, even as bad as it is now, the sparrow still finds water and it still finds Food. something to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we will, we will too. Multiplies quite rapidly the process. Is, so the, <laughs> is, is the attitude that we should have towards our earth now any different than the attitude we should have in the new earth? In other words, if we are going to be rulers going to be have uh, dominion and that kind of thing we're going to have to <coughs> excuse me support it and nurture that which we have the ability to do mm -hmm. is our role now any different well let me let me ask a, a maybe a related question ellen white suggests <laughs> that we have one twentieth of the vital capacity the vital force that adam had so that would suggest that the environment has is, is deteriorated considerably. Let me just read her words. Um, God endowed man with so great vital force that he has withstood the accumulation of disease brought upon the race in consequence of perverted appetites. I'm sorry, perverted habits. And has continued for 6,000 years. This fact of itself is enough to evidence to us the strength and electrical energy that God gave to man at his creation. It took more than 2,000 years of crime and indulgence of base passions to bring bodily disease upon the race to any great extent. If Adam, at his creation, had not been endowed with 20 times as much vital force as men now have, the race, with their present habits of living in violation of natural law, would have become extinct. 
volume three of the testimonies, page 132. So that might be the other extreme. If we want to really be, you know, just say, let everybody be as bad as they can be, how much longer before would we survive? Has, has, is something plaguing the earth since sin? Um, I, I mean, it seems like our discussion so far has been, you know, this all happening because humans are so bad. But has something happened to the nature of the whole thing? Or is it just humans tromp around and destroy everything? If, if, yeah. if somehow all of a sudden humans disappeared right now, mm -hmm. Would would nature still suffer nature from here? Nature would probably do fine. Um, there's a couple of comments from Scripture, and that's the, that would be my source of reference. Obviously, it wasn't the animals that sinned; it was Adam and Eve that sinned, and, and that therefore removed the Garden of Eden from this <clears throat> earth, and we're all out here, outside of the Garden of Eden. Romans eight tells us that all of creation is groaning under the weight of sin, basically waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, but my question would be, is somehow sin turned loose here and humans are subject, subject to it somehow and the animals are subject to it? Sounds or is it like just it. the humans are tromping around doing all the sinning and that's well, what... Well, okay, let's, let's deal that problem immediately. As far as we know, even if you could instantly remove all human beings, lions would still eat gazelles etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's still carnivores out there. We don't know what would happen to our world, uh, you know, if, if the animals were just completely allowed to multiply. And, I mean, they would come to some equilibrium probably eventually, <coughs> but, uh, you know. It's interesting, though. <coughs> it says that if we had, if the Israelites had done what they were supposed to do and that kind of, that the world would have gone back to its Edenic beauty. Yes. Would that mean that the lions quit eating gazelles? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Jim, in your uh, studies throughout the years, have you noticed, uh, what have you noticed being um, degraded in the plant or animal kingdom? Ha well, uh, Genesis 3 talks about the curses, mm -hmm. and you have uh, thorns and thistles on the plants, and that implies a, a, a change, some kind of effect that is mm -hmm. going to happen. Now, I don't know whether God retooled the creation instantaneously and said, okay, from now on it's going to be predation, tor thorns and thistles and so on, or whether God is saying, because you've made this choice, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, it, of course, it has happened. Is that the snake is cursed above all the creatures. So I kind of mm -hmm. guessed from that that all the creatures are cursed, but most of all the snake. Oh. First, in the sense of living within a sinful world. Y yes. Well, yes. And well, crawling on the ground. When, when, if you look, you mentioned Job 1. Mm -hmm. You have Satan there when all the sons of God were gathered together. What's Satan doing there? <laughs> he claims saying, to be in sovereign. He claims to be sovereign of this world. When Jesus was uh, talking to his disciples, you have a, a reference in John 12, in John 14, and in John 16. When in each case, Jesus called Satan the ruler or prince of this world. Satan has an influence in this world. Oh, yeah. And people ask, we'll, we'll talk, uh, we, we've studied this uh, on the problem of evil, but Satan's capricious. Mm -hmm. When he does something, you don't, he doesn't necessarily need any reason, and you can't predict it. He just does it. That's why these things happen, I think, capriciously. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you another question from your field of biology. Would you say that animals have deteriorated from ancient times to the present, or are we getting bigger and stronger and better animals? Well, I think nutrition has a lot to do with that, yeah. uh, a huge amount to do with that in medical care. Uh, it's interesting, according to evolutionary theory, a mutation occurs which is a little bit better than the wild type, and therefore selection favors individuals carrying that mutation. That has some interesting consequences. That mutation is located on a physical <coughs> spot on a chromosome. Mm -hmm. So if that portion is favored, so are all the other genes there. Mm -hmm. And if, as is thought, the number of useless mutations that's much higher than the number of good mutations, 
That means every time natural selection picks one of those useful mutations, it also picks maybe 10 mutations that are sort of a little bit harmful, not enough to make much difference. And over time, those nearly neutral mutations accumulate, and therefore, over time, the genome is deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be uh, an idea that evolutionists are aware of. It's not, I mean, it, it's not just uh, creationists saying this stuff, but it seems like it's, that's unavoidable. Are you if that's the case, then all of nature has been deteriorating ever since mm -hmm. the beginning just based on genetic principles. Even the fossil record, I mean, you have the giant saber-toothed tiger and the giant mammoths and the giant, I mean, a lot of fossils are huge compared to what we have today. It's true. And they're gone. Are you saying that a little bit of us gets better, a little bit of us, but most of us are deteriorating in, uh, in our bodies, so the deterioration supersedes whatever improvement is made. To an extent, yes. That's more or less the idea. Yes, there's That some happens over generations now, yes. as opposed to in, inside one individual. Yeah, it's not going on in one year or one generation. Now, this is an accumulation over a long are time. Are you saying that's what happens or that is, that is a fundamental principle or consequence of evolutionary approach? Well, it, it, evolution <coughs> uses those those processes, the evolutionary theorists mm -hmm. use those processes to explain their th how they think things happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's been pointed out that that very process brings with it genomic deterioration. So if yeah. we would follow the evolutionary path, evolutionists would actually say we're devolving. Well, I don't know if they'd say that or not, but <laughs> some years ago there was a paper published that said that actually the title of it was involved the term, it was a long title, but it had, why are we not extinct? Mm -hmm. the, the problem is we're, we're accumulating these mutations. Why haven't we gone extinct? Yeah, exactly. And w presumably we're heading in that direction. Yeah. Well, it, Genesis 2.15 is one of the key verses in, in this respect, and I'm reading from my Good News Bible. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. Mm -hmm. Now, you pointed out well, I don't know, maybe you, maybe somebody else did this, but anyway, in the lesson, it points out that this was, this is intended to be care, we're supposed to care for and protect mm -hmm. the, the rest of creation. So, that, that dominion certainly couldn't have, well, and we know it didn't in the Garden of Eden, include killing the animals for food. Yeah, you see, a good king is not one who abuses his subjects. Yeah. Right. He, he makes sure that they're well provisioned, he makes sure that they get along together. He settles disputes if necessary. Uh, makes sure that the infrastructure is in place. Yeah. That's what a good king does. That's our role, is, mm -hmm. to, is to nurture the other creatures. And there's, there's perhaps three aspects of that. We have the other creatures, we have the physical environment, and we have our own body. Mm -hmm. And it, each of these represents an aspect of our responsibility as good stewards. Yeah. Here's an off-the-wall question that I came across. Do you think that um, animals in the Garden of Eden had horns and tusks and claws? Would, we need, w would they have needed them? Uh, and maybe God's dominion was the fact that... Claws are very handy for climbing a tree, and they may need to climb a tree. Why? Get food? Because that's where they go to eat. And some of them have to rip out I just want to go look. Out of the ground, too. <laughs> look a long way. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe claws. <laughs> Mostly horns are used for fighting, to, for dominance and so forth. Was that kind of thing was still going on? Tusks? Well, didn't Ellen White say there were no jagged mountains, yeah. that the environment had soft rolling hills? So maybe not the corns, horns, tusks, and claws that we know today. Mm -hmm. but maybe they were softer or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, and because you can get hurt. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, something comes up and wants to say hello to you and just claws mm -hmm. you and you're bleeding, yeah. so. Well, that, that may be true, but I know that there are lots of creatures. I was in uh, Thailand one time and when I was younger and much more foolish than I am now, uh, 
I allowed an elephant to walk over me, laying down, and the elephant had a very large tusk. It, oh, did, it did not gore me, and it, as it began to walk over me, each foot so it scraped on you. came Good. and hit me and, you know, just tapped me a little bit and kind of scraped over my body and then down the other side and then the next one and the next and the next. So even though these creatures have horns or claws or whatever, actually we can still interact with them today. Lions, tigers, mm -hmm. elephants, even sharks. People go out swimming with the sharks all the time. Are you crazy? Uh, basically, <laughs> uh, just young and <laughs> as they say, I you know, can't believe it. <laughs> well, behavior is a big uh, part of this. Mm -hmm. the, the, the elk with his horns is a beautiful animal. Yeah. We appreciate that. It, the horns add to his beauty and the Absolutely. interest. Absolutely. And if he w didn't need to use them for defense or domination or something, he'd still benefit. I mean, we'd benefit from the, uh, from the beauty. From the yes. beauty. Okay. Yeah. The lady, the lady elks really like the, <laughs> the horns on the male elk. <laughs> it's attractive. But we know that the main use of those horns is to fight with. That's what they use them for. And this, in a dis <laughs> in a degraded world, they wouldn't have to use them for that. In another world. Just behavior. I see. <laughs> well, we as Seventh day Adventists believe that our message to the world is our, our main focus of our message to the world is supposed to be the three angels' messages. And those three angels' messages start off with respect and worship for the creator of heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Now, if we honor the creator of these things, shouldn't we honor what he made? And it's interesting to notice that. There's pretty severe warnings in the next two messages for people who don't. So now, does that mean <coughs> if I need a piece of furniture that I better not cut down a tree and make my piece of furniture out of that tree because that wouldn't be honoring God's nature? That well, uh, take your furniture. Just don't make a god out of the other half. <laughs> and, uh, That's Isaiah. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, or, you know, uh, we need metal for an engine, so we can't, the, 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 the greenies don't want us to dig any holes in the ground anymore. So, just, how, how far does this take us here? Are uh, you saying... Can't we, can't we, I don't know, can't we make anything? Can't we... And you can't have any urn. You can't, I'm cold. I can I cut down a tree and use it for fire? As Christians, should we be at the forefront of the um, save your environment, environment uh, save the forest, save the ocean, save the dolphins, mm -hmm. save everything? But we need to save man in the meantime. So what's the balance? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean that's what we're trying to discuss here. Um, God says. Once again, let's remember this. God says, Psalm 50, verse 10, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. And basically, I think we can extend from that idea that everything really belongs to him. He created it. We belong to him. Later, we're going to get to the part where we talk about human bodies. We belong to him. We're supposed to respect God by the way we care for our own bodies. So, you know, where... I mean, obviously, God intended for us to eat. He God intended for us to have clothing. God intended for us to have some kind of housing. Uh, I mean, they didn't need it in the Garden of Eden, but they, we needed it pretty quick after that. So I, I think he must have intended for us to use... So it's okay if I chop down a tree to make a house and to make some furniture, but um, I'm not supposed to chop down all of the trees and never replant. Yeah. No. Jim, what do you think the balance is? You wrote this lesson. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the You didn't know we were going to put you on the <laughs> grill here when you volunteered, <laughs> accepted our invitation to come. I think balance is a key word. I think we often can run to extremes. Mm -hmm. We do not regard <laughs> nature as divine or sacred. No. Neither do we regard nature as evil but we regard nature as a gift for which we have responsibility yeah. mm -hmm. and which we need to maintain for future generations mm -hmm. and on behalf of the Creator who delegated to us the responsibility to care for it, yeah. we need to care for it 
in a responsible, balanced way. One way we could say that is that we support human need, but not human greed. Yeah, very oh. good. Yeah, good. I like so, that. <laughs> so you're you're talking about uh, ex <coughs> there shouldn't be any extremism. Well, balance is important. Now, there, there, you're you're leading me on to a, a point here. <laughs> Go ahead and finish. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just just wondering about that because um, it just seems like. Um, I've been to some churches that have been so worried about the environment that they quit talking about Jesus. Mm. That's, the, um, that's too far, isn't it? That's way too far. And um, I don't know how saving the environment is going to really save us at the end. Well, consider, for example, how we treat other creatures. One thing, I, I didn't realize this, but there are factory farms mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. in which the animals are just totally abused and it's just to read about it sort of turns your stomach Ugh. and you know surely we would have something to say about factory farm pr uh, processes and practices yeah, yeah. Well, well I, ha I have uh, I have a uh, I have some needs I, ha I need light in my home and I have equipment that needs uh, uh, a lubrication and we haven't discovered petroleum yet so we get that uh, those needs I provide the heat the light for my home maybe heat for my home by getting oil from whales and um, isn't that a legitimate human need but we came almost to the place of uh, if we hadn't come across petroleum we would have just about extinguished uh, the whales and uh, you may you may be aware of that story but uh, um, you know, they, the, the, um, yeah. the, there, it got to the place where, you know, up, for example, up in the Nantucket area, they used to be able to just go out and, and fish and catch their whales, but the whales became so extinct that they had to far, go farther out in the, into the oceans, were gone for two years at a time and so forth. The whales were, were really almost extinct, but they were, were just meeting our need here. So how do we, how do we how do we I mean I gotta have light I've gotta have this stuff for my uh, d doesn't doesn't it seem to you that a responsible manager would consider what can be sustained what, what we call sustainable yield so then I wouldn't I come up with a whale farm you might cultivate whale like people <laughs> cultivate <laughs> sheep <laughs> but uh, a factory farm is different from just a farm yeah a factory sure farm the animals are treated like you would treat potatoes, thrown around, beaten, kept confined. Where the well, look, mean, look at an obvious example we've all probably all seen pictures of is is some of the chicken play, egg producing places. You know, and they're a little cramped spot, and all the you stuff in food on this end, and you expect an egg to come out on the other end. Well, those are those are genteel and kind compared yeah. to what they do to some of the other. Yeah, right? I, I know. And even even like the 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 sex the little chicks. They don't, they don't want the males. They throw them into a machine and it, turn, and it just grinds them up. Just, so, like, just like critters. So yeah. now, now, should I spend my time saving the chickens or should I spend my 24 hours a day uh, preaching, promoting the gospel? Well, let me give some examples. Again, I'm going to turn to Scripture. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. That's the, four, the fourth commandment, what we call the Sabbath commandment anyway. Exodus 23, verses 5 and 12. Proverbs 12, verses 10, Luke 14, 5. Some from the Old Testament, some from the New. Talk about specifically how human beings should relate to their domestic animals. Ellen White enlarges on that where she says, it is because of man's sin that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. And that's the verse I quoted from Romans 8, 22. Suffering and death were thus entailed not only upon the human race, but upon the animals. Surely then it becomes man to seek to lighten instead of increasing the weight of suffering which his transgression has brought upon God's creatures. He who will abuse animals because he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. A disposition to cause pain, whether to our fellow man or to the brute creation, is satanic. I don't know how you could be, say it more directly than that. Many do not realize that their cruelty will ever be known because the poor dumb animals cannot reveal it. But could the eyes of these men be opened, as were those of Balaam, 
they would see an angel of God standing as a witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up to heaven and a day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against those who abuse God's creatures. So is that part they, of the gospel to preach that? Patriarchs and Prophets 443, it certainly is. Well, you know, that goes along with um, how children are watched if they harm any kind of animals or pets. The psychologist, teacher, whatever is put on major alert because that child may grow up to be something that will inflict pain and mm -hmm. on humans. Well, on the other side, we're not going to be saved because we joined the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. But that ought to be our consideration. I mean, we should, we should weep if, if an animal gets killed alongside the road and so forth. That's not what God planned. One, one colleague that, that teaches here at Loma Linda was commenting on the necessity of killing animals. And he said, we may have to kill animals, but if we do, it should be with a sense of regret. Yes. I like the way he said it, a sense of regret. It's a necessity, but there's no joy in it. Mm -hmm. Well, the actually, uh, original uh, cultures that used to, uh, or still do, when they, uh, some of the Indian tribes, and, uh, and when they had to go out, and they felt that they were part of, of nature, and when they go ahead out and kill an animal for, for food, well, they would apologize to the animal and uh, pray to its spirit and try to make peace with the fact that they wanted to be, that they really didn't want to do this. You know, Garrison Keeler has a story about... Um, about uh, the slaughtering of, of, a, a, of a pig uh, for, for food on their farm. And um, they had some in a pen, and some of the kids, this is one of his Prairie Home Companion stories, <clears throat> started throwing stones at those pigs. Mm. And when, they, when the farmer found out about that, he was irate, and he told those children, if you ever do that again. Because the, the, the pig was... In this case, it was a source of their food, and, and it was to be respected for that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my nephew, um, whenever he eats beef, he says he has nightmares, bloody nightmares. And I tell him that I read someplace, and I don't know if it's true, that when a cow goes to slaughter, they're in a line, and they're getting slaughtered. They know what's happening to their friends up there, and they're getting nervous and panicked. They're not dumb animals and this adrenaline shoots through them. Mm -hmm. So when you eat meat, you're getting this shot of adrenaline and uh, somehow it doesn't go with I, him. I have a good friend who grew up uh, not as an Adventist, knew nothing about Adventists at all, in Spain. And this lady said the juiciest and the best tasting, ma tasting meat of all was from the bulls that were killed in the bullfight. After all they had been through, that was the best tasting. Because of all the adrenaline in them? Yeah. But it gives my nephew nightmares. And time and time again, he doesn't know it gives him nightmares until he looks back and he saw that he ate mm -hmm. meat the night before. Well, <coughs> our, evolutionist fr huh? our evolutionist friends would say, there's really not that much difference between an animal and human being. I mean, we just went down different evolutionary paths. And I'm quoting, one set philosopher has even argued that a chicken or even a fish has more personhood than does a fetus in the womb or even a newborn infant. However ridiculous these ideas might sound, they can be derived with a fair amount of logic from an atheistic evolutionary model of human rights. I do notice that many people uh, treat their animals much better than most human beings on planet mm -hmm. Earth. Mm -hmm. Dressing them up and putting their bells and mm -hmm. ribbons and things on them and even the uh, quality of food that they're fed. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it can be, uh, once you've been to very poor nations and you've seen hungry children, it, it can be uh, a little bit much to see how, we, how well we treat our animals. Mm -hmm. So you, got, you have animals that are treated too well mm -hmm. and animals that are treated too bad. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be somewhere the, in the mm -hmm. correct in middle the world there. of balance over here. In the balance. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I've noticed that we, we seem to have more care for an animal. The more the animal reflects a human, the more yeah. care we have to them. Sure. Um, so I, I think it would be the hardest to shoot a chimpanzee than it would be a cow. 
you know, just because they reflect humans more than, than anybody else. Well, you go right down the, down the path to a dog, mm -hmm. a dog, very friendly, they're, they act like friends to you, they seem to have whatever, and you know, if you kick a dog, you can get arrested. Culture. But you get clear down to, to the time when you start getting into ugly spiders, where they start, <laughs> don't start, they're still life, but, um, you know, they do, don't look like men, I mean people anymore. Then you have no time, trouble at all stomping on them or Can getting I rid of them. I think question culture. about fetus. You mentioned fetus, and I wanted to know about fingerprints and things like that of a fetus. But before that, I, I remembered you'd mentioned the Sabbath. And since we're talking about animals, I know that we're instructed not to work the animals on, on the Sabbath. Sabbath. This sounds like a God who's very concerned about his animals, his mm -hmm. creatures that he created, wanting them to, you know, have a good life and, and not have too much of a burden. Well, I don't know. I think there's a problem there because um, try to put an animal out there and tie him up to his little grinder and have him going over the Sabbath. Are you going to be able to do your Sabbath stuff knowing that that animal is out there oh, grinding this yeah. stuff? Yeah. And Precisely it, God's point. Well, this is another so, question. Maybe, uh, Jim, I... My family came, is dairying from a dairy, dairy background. And the cows produce have to be milked twice a day. Now, do you think that man trained the cows to do that? Because I can't imagine if you leave a cow not milked on the Sabbath, they might explode or get, get, have damage. So I know very conservative Christian people who they consider that is their duty on the Sabbath to relieve the animal. But do you think that milk, cows have already always given milk every day? And well, clearly they've been bred and selected for that purpose. Okay. Now, in nature, they're not doing that. So in the olden days, they could leave a cow on the Sabbath and the cow could relax, well, whereas the, remember now... The, the, the calves are out there, they're demanding their food 24-7. Well, in the dairies, they take their calves away I know, that's, 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 why, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. It's a, not a natural situation. Okay, is it? okay, yeah. That's However, it is true the cow becomes uncomfortable when it needs to be milked. Mm -hmm. And it's, it seems to me it's an act of kindness to milk it, regardless yeah. of what day it is. There's, just because yeah. it's Sabbath doesn't mean your cow should suffer. No. And of oh, course, you need, to, you, you need to remember that the, the cow was the calf is supposed to be drinking the cow's milk, not the human. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. I have two questions. You mentioned how a king should be, you know, virtuous, but when you have a world that's segmented, each person, each king, if you will, if head of state, he only cares about his own people. Uh, like right now, we are in we are in real trouble with. Iran and North Korea. We thinking we are thinking and we're thinking about uh, nuclear war may develop. The, we have things that it's not only just animals, people. I think the first thing is what Jesus says is love God and then love your neighbors. Because once you love everyone as an extension to as to yourself as a extension of God, then all those things I think would fall into place. And another thing Gary mentioned, but it has to do with culture. In the Philippines, they eat dog. In mm -hmm. the Philippines, the dog is not Fido. It's meat. <laughs> in de it depends on where you're from. Yeah, sure. And th it's not the same thing. People see things different. The cricket is a delicacy that at some places that cost a lot of money. China. You go to Japan, people are eating fish that are still moving. Mm -hmm. Well, I notice that like when you go out to a farm where they have beef cows or anything, you know, farms that generally have everything, they can, they can kill a sheep or a cow like a, pulling a turnip out of the ground. It doesn't make any difference to them. They, they have hardly any feelings for anything just because of that. And you go to a city, you know, and they see somebody killing a cow. Oh, man, that's so bad. It's so dangerous. It's so terrible. You know. we, we, we don't have much time left. We still have a few subjects, parts of the lesson we need to cover. What about our treatment of our own bodies and treatment about the bodies of other human beings? And I'll start with this comment from Ellen White. It's based really on 1 Corinthians uh, 6, verses 19 and 20, if you want to look at that. 
But here's her words. Let none who profess godliness regard with indifference the health of the body. I mean, even your own body is property of God. And flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. The standard of virtue is elevated or degraded by the physical habits. Any habit which does not promote healthful action in the human system degrades the higher and noble facility, faculties. Helen, that's Review and Herald, January 25, 1881. Um, are we Does abusing God's creation if we abuse our bodies? Is she saying the higher faculties means our brain? Our brain. So whatever we do to our body affects our brain. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah. So in that, yes. There's a win-win situation yeah. here in terms of human mm -hmm. needs and in terms of the environment and that is vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. It takes far more water, far more soil, far more grain to raise a pound of beef well, than to times. raise a, mm -hmm. at least, depending on whether it's water, yeah. soil, or land, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that compared to a, a, a pound of a vegeted, vegetable food. Exactly. Thank Genesis you. 1, 29, right mm -hmm. at the first chapter had the instruction. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until you get to Genesis 9, he said, well, if, you know, if, then he tells them what, what animals you could eat, is anything that moves. But that was because the people were probably already doing it, and they would become brutes by that time. And Do you had, know, good. Excuse me. is our land being depleted? Have you seen any studies? Um, oh, yeah, our, nutritionally. We are... Does the Sahara Desert look depleted? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know. Well, we, we supplement, of course, the nutrients in the soil with fertilizers and so on. I don't have any, any I haven't really followed that particular uh, problem, but... The uh, uh, vegetables and fruits then still are nutritious. Oh, yes. They wouldn't grow in soil that didn't have what they need to grow. Because okay. there's a lot of thought that we have. We don't have, I've heard some people say, we don't have any good soil left anymore, so I might as well not garden. But you can make good soil. Build it up. That's yes. another thing we can do for the environment. Yeah, exactly. Make it better than when you first came. Plant a tree. Put some fr yeah. compost yeah. on all those things. And another quote from Ellen White. This is Christ's Obulus in 326 and 327. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions. We all hope that God is preparing us a place for, place for us in the heavenly mansions. Then is the special place designed on earth where we are to work for God. How about that? Are we, are we filling the place that God has made for each one of us here on this earth? Are you saying we're supposed to bloom where we're planted for yes, God? Wherever exactly. we are, we're supposed to bloom right there and do what is at our hand? Yes. Well, look at this extreme. I'm just picking out a few things. A famous Australian by the name of Peter Singer raised some very serious questions when he wrote in his book, Far From Having Concern for All Life, or a, uh, or a scale of concern impartially based on the nature of the life in question, those who protest against abortion but dine regularly on the bodies of chickens, pigs, and calves show only a biased concern for the lives of members of our own species. For on, for on any fair comparison of morally relevant characteristics like rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, autonomy, pleasure, pain, and so on, the calf, the pig, and the much derided chicken come out well ahead of the fetus at any stage of pregnancy. While if we make the comparison with a fetus of less than three months old, a fish would show more signs of consciousness. So how does that impact you? However, it is the human fetus that has the potential to become Einstein. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the pig and, doesn't. And what is the evidence that Mr. Singer is referring to on this claim? Yeah. I have a feeling he's totally wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Why, but, why would he be wrong? Studies of embryos in the, in the womb have shown that they're responding to the vowel sounds that their mothers are producing. Yeah, right. There's a lot more going on inside yeah. there than it sounds like from this quote. So there's two things we've seen. One, those creatures are, are already growing, they're already learning inside the womb. But more than that, as, as Gordon has pointed out, what we're talking about is the potential. What is the potential for that creature? What's the potential for a fish? He's never going to be an Einstein, you know? Well, so. there's also a potential for a human to go to heaven for eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So this fetus in, in the womb, um, it's basically at what stage is that fetus developed with things like fingerprints or eyes or? Well, fingerprints are not essential for life. Um, at, this point in, at this point in time, a, 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 a fetus can survive with a lot of help. Can survive, not ideally, but can survive after about week 20 of pregnancy. And that means when they're born, they're about this big. But as Jim said, even far before that, they're reacting to the mother's voice. Sure. Well, I'm not sure the time, but before they're born, yeah. They're oh, responding yeah. to the yeah. mother's voice. I, I think kind of what I was getting at, though, was at, at about how old can we see this fetus that this is actually a human being, was my kind well, of meaning if, if with you, fingers. If you're talking about when he starts to look like a human being, that's very early. Within the first few weeks? Seven or eight weeks. Why is that important? Well, I mean, if we can see that this entity, this fetus, is a human, then it's a human. Not that I'm not saying or drawing a line on any type of uh, particular week, but if this is a human yeah. and we can see that it's a human and we're aborting this human, there's, in my opinion, there's a problem here. Well, and I wish we had time to talk about this whole scale, but some of you had the privilege of attending classes taught by Dr. Pavancha on this campus in some years past. He's now passed, passed away. But he, he talked about the different levels, you know, fully human and, and maturing human, maybe still a child and so forth, down to, to potential human and down to meaning human. And meaning human is the lowest level, but that might be a person who's completely comatose and dying, but that body there, even though it has no consciousness that we can detect, no real consciousness, it still means human being. So it's, it still has something, he's still on the scale, even though it may be at the bottom of the scale. So we need to remember that. In what, any case. What's our attitude toward life? Yeah, That's exactly. a really important yeah. point. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, you see that there's lots of issues that could be expanded on. We hope you've enjoyed our lesson together. If you would like to look at the materials that we have followed uh, in our study, you can go to our website at Theological Crossroads. That's theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. And we hope you enjoy your lesson as much as we have ours here today. And thank you for joining us. See you next week.